this week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. It's time to make it rain. You are clear to level the building. Hi, that's a correct jump. Give me 10 seconds. Roger. Yeah, direct this right there. We're going as fast as we can, crew. We're going to town, man. There you go. Get ready. Third wave, third wave. No joy lost. Yeah. There's a term in there, you know, a lot of people say, make it rain. Yeah, let it rain, make it rain. And that term is just verboten in our community. Yeah. <laughs> we're not going to make it rain. We pride ourselves on accuracy. We're not just going to roll in and spray an entire area. So it's great, you know, a Hollywood catchphrase, but our folks really train to be as accurate as possible. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the show. That's right. Today we're talking about the AC-130 gunship and... Uh, hold on a second. Stupid face masks. Anyway, as I was saying, this is episode 80. I am your host, Jello, and yep, we're talking the mighty AC-130 gunship with retired United States Air Force Colonel Craig Walker. Well, they might not make it rain, but they do some pretty good work, as we will hear in just a bit. But first, some announcements and a few listener questions. First up, if you enjoy military aviation reading, be sure to check out the Musings page on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com where we regularly post articles by various writers. In fact, just this past week, we published an entertaining and informative piece by high schooler Ryan Gilchrist about a near aerial engagement between Iraqi MiGs and U.S. forces patrolling the southern no-fly zone back in early 1999. Next, a couple announcements for you DCS enthusiasts out there. First, you may already be aware of the free-for-all campaign Eagle Dynamics is running between now and May 18th, permitting free gameplay and steep discounts on items you may wish to purchase. Well, thanks to an arrangement with Eagle Dynamics, you can take an additional 10% off your purchase during free-for-all month on their eShop when you use the code FighterPilot at checkout, and that's FighterPilot, all one word, for an extra 10% off. Secondly, our teammate Baltic Dragon is putting the final touches on a DCS campaign based on Kevin Miller's book Raven One. You might be familiar with that naval aviation thriller. Well, Hoser, who you may also remember is a former guest of the show, he's been advising us on the construction of this campaign for over a year now, and we hope to release it in July 2020. Stay tuned for updates here on the show and especially on our sister podcast, Air Combat Sim, also brought to you by all of us here at BVR Productions. All right, next, why don't we take some listener questions and we'll start this week with a phone call. Hello, I'm Nugget 7 I'm from Chicago. And how can the Iranians purchase parts for an F-14 Top Gun? All right, I enjoy your show and uh, look forward to an Iranian F-14 pilot interview. Let me know. Okay. How about an email instead? Andy from Boise, Idaho says, I just watched a video of a crash on board an aircraft carrier. It made me wonder what instruction would be given to the airplanes airborne in the event there was an obstruction on the carrier deck to prevent landing. Would tanker support be sent your way and you would be directed to the nearest land-based runway? Or would you be instructed to hold until the obstruction was cleared? So, Andy, the first thing that would happen is all the planes would be told to fly the most fuel conservative profile possible while the ship assesses the situation. And if you ever listen to carrier communications, you hear them use the term 99 a lot. That just means, hey, everybody listen. And then the term for holding would be delta. So it'd be 99 delta. And it might even be if it's case three, they might say delta four, meaning everybody expect at least a four minute delay. Or if it's case one or case two, you might hear delta easy, meaning just kind of hang out where you are. But the big thing is, depending on the amount of debris on the flight deck and the availability of divert fields, airborne aircraft would either maybe wait until the flight deck is reopened or they would divert and that decision would be made by the ship. And if it was relatively simple to clean up, then again, they might just land. If it wasn't, then they might be sent somewhere else if another airfield is in fact available. Sometimes it's not when you're out in the middle of the, say, Pacific Ocean. The Air Wing has its own aerial refueling capability, as Dud and I discussed way back on episode five, if you remember that show on aerial refueling. 
And I would say it's not common for big wing tankers to be sortied out to the ship, let's say in the Persian Gulf, but I suppose it could happen. It's pretty rare. I don't think I've ever seen it. Now, if you're operating, let's say, in training off the coast of San Diego and there was an Omega civilian tanker that was supporting you, well, yeah, they could probably come and help out. But again, in training somewhere near friendly shores, then you might just send everybody back depending on the mishap. All right, next, let's take another phone call. Hey, Jello, this is Luke Bates from Greensboro, North Carolina. Just wanted to ask you a question about squadrons. What are they? Are they made up of just pilots or pilots and crews? How do new pilots get into squadrons? Just all those details. Anyway, love the show. Really enjoy F-15 month. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. So the use of the word squadron varies between services. Now, according to Google, a quote, squadron is an aviation unit consisting of two or more flights of aircraft and the personnel required to fly them. And that is how the Navy and Marine Corps uses the term. So in those branches, you could have, let's say, a squadron of 10 FA-18s and say 15 pilots or maybe 30 pilots and whizzos if it was a two-seat squadron. And then you would have another roughly 180 troops working in maintenance, operations, safety, administration, the various departments. And that whole unit, that squadron would go out and do whatever the tasking was. Now, the Air Force, on the other hand, uses the term more like one of the dictionary.com definitions, which says a number of persons grouped or united together for some purpose. Now, you may recall this came up during our recent Boneyard episode where I asked Regen about the use of the word squadron when she used it. And it sounds like they use it both for organizations with aircraft and organizations without. And even the organizations with are not necessarily the maintenance squadrons also. I think it sounds like, from what I've learned, those are different organizations, although they will come together. But your operations squadron and your maintenance squadron are not necessarily going to be under the same leadership in an Air Force organization. All right. Now, interestingly, squadron has other non-aviation but still military applications, including these definitions that I read. A principal division of an armored or cavalry regiment consisting of two or more troops and a group of warships detached on a particular duty or under the command of a flag officer. So squadron can be used for aviation, surface, and soldiers. Pretty interesting. There you go, Luke. Okay, final question for this week, and why don't we make it another phone call? Hi, Jello and the fighter pilot team. This is Kerry Kenner from Charlotte with a question. The F-35 is the latest in the string of F- excellent episodes. While the F-35 is sold as a single plane for all three services, how big are the differences? Senko talked about the cockpit displays being standard between the three versions, and he mentioned the external differences such as wing sizes and landing gear. So where does it stand on the parts commonality scales compared to, say, an F-4 Phantom? In other words, what percentage of parts can actually be shared between the three versions? Thank you, and enjoy the podcast. All right, I had to put your question to our F-35 guest, Cinco, Kerry, and he told me the parts commonality among these three models is right around 30%. To me, that doesn't sound like very much as similar as the three look, but I guess when you stop and think about the differences Cinco mentioned during our interview on our past episode, I guess that sounds about right. Anyway, I don't know. 30% is what it is. All right, that will do it for questions for this episode. Thank you very much for submitting them and calling them in. If you are still waiting to hear your question addressed on the show, I appreciate your continued patience as we try to work through just a few of them every episode. All right. Well, hey, we've had our announcements. We've had our questions. Why don't we get to the feature interview? It was recorded back in January 2020 when we were still allowed to travel and hang out with people without our masks on. But I hope you'll enjoy it. Here we go with Craig Walker, call sign Buck. Colonel Craig Walker, United States Air Force, joins us today in studio. He is a former AC-130 pilot. Buck, how's it going? It's going great, Jello. Thanks for having me on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. We are back in beautiful Las Vegas, and uh, you're here for some business. We'll find out all about that. Let's start with you. Where are you from? What did you do in the Air Force, and what are you doing now? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm a military brat. My dad was an F-4 guy stationed over in Germany, so I was actually born at Bitburg Air Force Base. Oh, wow. After that, my parents moved down to Homestead Air Force Base. Unfortunately, they split up and my mom decided to stay there. So I grew up in South Florida, pushed off to the University of Miami, uh, where I did my undergrad and then off to pilot training. After pilot training, the Air Force was a little bit uh, heavy on the pilots. So I actually did two years in a maintenance job before going back to the cockpit. 
two brief years in slicks, and then I pushed off to uh, AC-130s in the special ops community. Okay. I spent uh, a bunch of years in the ops squadron, uh, upgraded to shooter, instructor, and evaluator pilot. And then in uh, the late 90s, the Air Force had decided to open up the aperture on the Air Force Weapons School. Obviously, uh, for some folks, they don't know it's the Air Force version of Top Gun. And I was selected to be initial cadre in that course. Spent three wonderful classes. I was had the distinction of going through weapons school three times. <laughs> had to audit it, then had, we had to write our syllabus, and we had to validate okay. it. So a bit painful. It wasn't because it took you three tries. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would say I'm a little slow, but I wasn't that slow. All right. So it worked out. Then I spent three and a half years as an instructor there. Pushed off to uh, some formal education. The Air Force wanted me to get a little smarter. Went to uh, Air Command Staff College. Then uh, a second year of education in the Advanced Studies Group. Went to Quantico for the Marine Corps School of Advanced Warfighting. Wonderful. Probably the highlight of my educational career going there. Uh, pushed into the Pentagon for an assignment. Uh, some pain and misery, but everybody has to do it, they say, <laughs> at some point. Uh, mine wasn't too bad. The first part, I worked in a strategy cell, which was okay. awesome. And then I uh, got pushed over to the E-ring to be an exec for the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Air Force. I achieved terminal velocity, escaped the uh, Pentagon, nice. and went back to the weapons school to be an ops officer. Did a squadron command tour there. My command tour was curtailed. I was fortunate I got promoted a little bit early. So I got a year and, and a day of command. Then I went hmm. back up to Quantico for Marine War College, into the Pentagon for a tour in the office of the Secretary of Defense. After that, 22 months of fun out to Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico, where I was the vice wing commander. Out of that job, I deployed to Africa, running ops in the Horn of Africa in the, the Arabian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Then back to uh, ASOC headquarters, serving as the A-58 and uh, decided to retire after that and spend a little more time with the family. <laughs> wow, you've really bounced around. Yes, I did. Okay, so how many years of service was that? 26 years. Wow, all right. And how many flight hours did you end up with? Uh, a little over 4,000. Wow. Uh, most of them in the gunship, uh, 179 combat missions. So uh, had a lot of fun. Well, this is, I think, one of those crowd-pleaser aircraft that everybody's looking forward to hearing about because it's menacing, it's big, it's uh, it's adapted, in my mind at least, from something that doesn't quite seem right, but boy, is it lethal. So let's just jump right into it. But let's start, if you're willing, kind of back at the beginning. I mean, the AC-130 is not the first aircraft to demonstrate this concept. Have there been gunships back in uh, previous conflicts? Yeah, there were actually gunships in Vietnam. The original concept started, uh, there were some writings about uh, using a platform in World War II with side-firing guns in the anti-submarine warfare role. Hmm. That never re really materialized. It really came into its own in Vietnam. There was a, an Air Force captain, Ron Terry, who's kind of known as the father of the gunship, who had seen how effective C-47 flare aircraft were in protecting some of the hamlets over in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He and a couple others were aware of a technique that some bush pilots were using in South America where they would fly a very tight orbit over a particular point on the ground and they could lower a basket on a rope down to the ground and they could exchange, you know, put uh, stuff down on the ground and pick it back up and bring it to the airplane. And they used that concept to go ahead and start the gunship. The C-47s, the AC-47s were mm -hmm. the first version. They had three Gatling guns that were on the airplane, and they were used with devastating effect in Vietnam. In fact, the AC-47, in fact, all gunships in Vietnam have the distinction that if a gunship was over, had a hamlet, that hamlet never fell. Mm -hmm. There were a couple different permutations, and I know we got a limited time here, but there were a couple other versions of the gunship. But when it really starts to uh, get to what we see today is when they moved into the C-130 platform because it was so much bigger and could carry so many more munitions right. and much longer endurance. Okay, so just to draw a parallel, if I'm flying along in my trusty F-18 and I want to attack a ground target with my gun, I do a strafing run, and it's over pretty quickly. Yep. Now, there's also artillery which is in a fixed position and it's supporting folks on the ground. Are you sort of a hybrid of the two of those in a sense? We pride ourselves on being primarily a close air support weapon, but we do differ from the, the pointy nose guys in that we employ weapons from anywhere in the orbit on the target. And that's mm -hmm. why a lot of times between us and the A-10, we're the preferred close air support weapon of choice. Excellent. All right. So the... Aircraft was designed, now obviously it's based on the C-130, adapted to that, but the idea is that it's designed to support folks on the ground. Is that true? Or is it going to go out and do its own maybe target interdiction or anything without folks on the ground? Or? Absolutely. We can do a host of missions from right. SCAR, uh, even FAC-A and uh, CSAR if we had to, interdiction. Mm -hmm. But our real bread and butter is close air support. 
And it's a small community. There's a very limited number of gunships. They call it a low density, high demand unit. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, we tend to train habitually with a lot of the partners that we're going to employ with in combat, the same SEALs, Green Beret, all the ODA teams. At times, it's such a small community, you will actually recognize the guy's voice on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that intimacy of working with them, you can tell by the octave in their voice just how bad the situation is. Right. But that also helps us because we've trained to better. We're better at employing together. Okay. Well, that makes sense. All right. So working with the guys on the ground is kind of the bread and butter for this thing. What are we using? Let's jump right to the weapons. I mean, we have a host of weapons and it seems to change a lot depending on the variant. But for the AC-130 that's out there right now, what are some of the weapons that we'll see on that aircraft? Yeah, I'm going to kind of break it down into four different groups. Now, okay. We're down to two different gunships, but a lot of changes have happened in the last couple of years. So uh, you used to have the AC-130H, which a lot of people will know is the Spectre gunship. Okay. For a long time, it had two 20-millimeter Vulcan cannons. It had a 40-millimeter Bofors cannon and then the 105-millimeter howitzer. That's the airplane I flew for the majority of my career. We actually took the 20s off in the late 90s after some of our employments in Bosnia because of the threat was driving us to higher altitudes. Mm -hmm. And then we plussed up the number of 40 millimeter and 105 millimeter munitions that we carried on the airplane. Unfortunately, that airplane, I, I loved it, but it happens to the best of them there. It's in the boneyard. It's okay. been there for the past couple of years. That uh -huh. left the AC-130U, which was an airplane that came along in the late 90s. That particular gunship had a 25 millimeter Gatling gun, the 40 millimeter Bofors cannon, and a 105. Another highly uh, capable aircraft. Those aircraft have now come off the battlefield and they're on their way to the boneyard <laughs> as well. So that leaves two different variants. What you have today is the AC-130W Whiskey gunship. Okay. And then the entire community is transiting to the AC-130J. The AC-130W is seen as somewhat of a risk reduction for the permanent AC-130J, but it has a 30 millimeter Bushmaster chain gun. They've been modified with a 105 millimeter howitzer. Mm -hmm. It has a common launch tube system that carries the 176, the Griffin missile system. Hmm. And they're also outfitted with small diameter bombs. So it brings wow. a smorgasbord yeah. of weapons to the battlefield. The AC-130J, which is what the entire fleet's moving to, the whiskeys will go to the boneyard here in a couple of years. It'll have the same 30 millimeter Bushmaster cannon, the 105 millimeter howitzer, the uh, common launch tube for the Griffin missile, small diameter bomb, and Hellfire missile. So it brings a lot of smack down to wow. the battlefield. Yeah, I'll say. So 105 millimeter howitzer, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that basically a similar round, or at least the weapon, I don't know, but to what the Army or the Marines might have on the ground as far as artillery goes? Yeah, absolutely. The early 105s that we got, we got about a million rounds from the Army and wow. started using them. But because they're used on an aircraft in flight, they had to go through a very rigorous NDI inspection uh, okay. to make sure they wouldn't Non-destructive in inspection, inspection, x-rays yeah. mm -hmm. and, and some other things to make sure okay. there weren't any flaws in there. We've used up most of those rounds. So uh, <laughs> SOCOM has acquired other 105 okay. in the meantime. The 40 millimeter that I talked about on the AC-130H and the U model, that's being phased out. But we used up uh, a lot of that ammunition yeah. downrange. So what we're left with today is the 30 and the 105, wow. and, and they're still making lots of that. And those earlier variants sounds like they're gone, the 20 millimeter. Did you say that was a Gatling gun? I mean, that sounds a lot like the gun in my F-18. Same gun. It was just oh, uh, okay. derated, if you will, down to 2,500 rounds per minute. Okay. Because we're doing that orbit, we can employ our weapons throughout the entire orbit. I don't have to worry about a strafe run. Mm -hmm. So uh, slowing it down a little bit, let us put some saturation fires down there. Okay. So we have these different weapons. What's driving the change? Is it just because better technology is allowing new weapons to come along? Or why the difference between the H models and now the Js? Yeah, I think the biggest thing on the weapons between, certainly for the 20 millimeter is the slant range. When you're employing at a much higher altitude, the round loses velocity on mm -hmm. the way to the ground. And there's questions about would it detonate when it hits the ground? You don't want to just throw chunks of metal. The 30 millimeter has much better ballistic characteristics, so you can shoot it from much farther range. And then the same thing with the 105. Okay. And then the 40 millimeter, I'm trying to think of an example for the listener. I mean, if you watch maybe old movies from World War II, you got the anti-aircraft guns on the side of a ship maybe, and they kind of alternate back and forth. The listener can't see my arms here, but <laughs> is that kind of what it is? It's That's like exact, single round? Okay. Exactly right. A lot of people would call it the pom-pom guns. Okay. When you'd see them shooting, and you'll see the guys actually feeding rounds into the top in wow. four round clips. That is the same gun. There's actually a left-hand gun and a right-hand gun. Huh. 
And I have shot ammunition that was labeled United States Navy 1943. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm surprised that passed the NDI. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I have to keep myself on track because there's so many things here. They're all shiny. So let's start with, as we record this right now, the show has not done an episode on the C-130, but we'll leverage some other time that discussion. Are these aircraft being built from scratch as AC-130s or are they taking C-130s and adapting them? They're taking regular C-130s and adapting them. That's how it started with the A model. Okay. The H model and U model started out as slick C-130s mm -hmm. in the uh, the mobility fleet. They were moved over to AFSOC and modified. Same with the Whiskey. The newer gunships, the J models, have been coming off the line as MC-130 J. So they come off the line with refueling pods mm. and then they go into a, a mod while they're still brand new. They remove that, right. cut big holes in the side of the aircraft, yeah. put all the computers and the weapons inside. So they're delivered to AFSOC as okay. basically new C-130s, but they were modified. And then adapted for the purpose. Okay. And then let's talk about the crew. So obviously there's a lot of folks involved. Let's start at the beginning. How about at the front? Yeah, absolutely. So in the older gunships, when I flew on the AC-130H, you had 13 crew members on there. The newer gunships have fewer, but uh, the pilot or the aircraft commander, you're sort of like uh, an orchestra conductor. So uh, you got a pilot up front, a co-pilot, and a flight engineer who's managing your electrics, your fuel, your pneumatics. And then he or she is also a threat observer looking out the window while you're employing in combat. Up on the flight deck in the H model, you would have a fire control officer and a navigator. In the U model, they would be back down in the booth in the back of the aircraft. You would also have a couple sensor operators. One of them is a low light level TV operator. Think of a pair of NVGs on steroids, have been modified like fifth, five generations past that, a very capable sensor. And then an infrared sensor, which the viewers will know from watching a police helicopter sure. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, very highly modified and very capable. In the booth, you would also have an electronic warfare officer who has a, a host of equipment to see any of the electrons that are hitting the airplane, and then obviously uh, electronic countermeasures to be able to push some electrons back out and defeat a threat. In the back of the aircraft, you would have five gunners. They're not actually sitting back there shooting the guns. We can kind of get to that. <laughs> They're great folks, and they'll play tricks on people at air shows. There's a little window over top of the 105. It's only a like three or four inches wide, and they would draw a little fake gun sight there. But the, the guns are actually being fired by a combination of the pilot and the sensors and the entire TAC crew. Okay. But the gunners are actually servicing, loading the weapons in the back. And then the last crew member you would have on there would be a loadmaster okay. who uh, augments a couple of the other duties and then actually has a little seat up on the ramp of the aircraft in a bubble where he or she can scan behind the aircraft for any threats that are mm. coming at us. The modern gunships, the Whiskey and the J model, they're trying to reduce that crew size. Mm -hmm. They're going through a couple of permutations right now where one of them will have, both will have a, a pilot and a co-pilot. You won't have a flight engineer, but you'll have a, a fire control officer. And then the folks that are sitting in the back are now called CISOs, combat systems operators. Okay. And they're talking about an enlisted center operator and then a couple of gunners that also double in the loadmaster duties. So people being a very expensive asset to maintain, that's where the Air Force has tried to cut a little bit is the number yeah. of, of folks on a gunship. And you've talked about the defensive systems. I mean, this is a big airplane. And of course, if you're relatively overhead a target, a lot of targets are defended. Is that a concern for you guys? I mean, I'm guessing you do most of your operations at night? Most of the operations are at night. We will do selected daytime operations depending on the threat and the importance of the mission. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we do have a host of different systems on the airplane to defend it. The J model is going through a new upgrade. There's a program that they're working through right now. But I can speak to the H model and the U model that I flew with in the community. We had the LQ-172 version 3, which is a pretty smart jammer that dealt with a lot of different threats. But at the end of the day, it's still a C-130 with the RCS, the radar cross-section of a barn door. <laughs> so uh, what those systems are really going to do is give you a little bit of time and room to escape if one of those threats pops up. You're not going to try and push your way into uh, North Korea you know, and, and go shoot up the, the so, headquarters. Yeah, so a relatively permissive environment is required. Yeah, we call it low to selected medium threat environments. Okay. And then having other assets from some of the, the platforms you've talked about on mm -hmm. here, if you had jamming or CJ, F-16s or, or uh, growlers on board, that, mm -hmm. that might suppress some of the air defenses enough to get in and do a high priority mission. Cool. You know, I'm guessing you don't want to talk about how high it is, but it's going to be relatively high up there. How accurate can we be with an aircraft that's loitering, propeller-driven, in a constant angle of bank turn we haven't talked about? But with those weapons on board and those systems, how good are we? We're very accurate. Yeah? We, uh, we advertise two mils 
as our accuracy to milliradians. So if you were at 10,000 feet, that means that 50% of your rounds would land within 20 feet of the target. Okay. Sometimes you can do a little bit better than that. We actually use a couple different techniques. One of them is called two-shotting. So uh, once you get into the area, you will do what we call a tweak, and that's at a benign target on your way there. You'll go ahead and shoot a couple rounds and see how the guns are doing that well mm. or that day, how tight the system is. And a lot of different variables affect it from the D value to the humidity to the mm. winds. And we'll take that error and enter it into the system. And then once you get to the target and start to employ, if the weapons are all hitting low and aft, well, then you just kind of use Kentucky windage and move your aim point <laughs> high and forward. Yeah, and yeah. guess what? You, you tend to be pretty accurate. Okay. And are all these different systems, I'm guessing, tied together? I mean, you've got the aircraft's INS that might even be contributing, but you said you had the different uh, visual systems and everything else. Is it all communicating to, to give your system the best possible accuracy? Absolutely. So there's a couple of mission computers on board the aircraft. You have uh, a couple INSs that you mentioned that are going to help calculate your accuracy. Obviously, a GPS feed. And what the system's really doing is it's measuring your position using those data points, but it's also using the look angles. A lot of trigonometry going on in this airplane, where mm -hmm. the sensor's looking, how it measures the angle in both elevation and azimuth to the target, and then it solves all that to get a pretty good position of where the target is, where to aim the gun, how to compensate for elevation, lead lag angle. Right. Because it's kind of interesting as you're flying an orbit around a gunship, when you shoot, it's not the strafe run that you're used to. Mm -hmm. As you're orbiting and you push that round out the side, it still has a forward velocity vector component. Right. So the computers will help you adjust for some of that. Crazy. And so you're generally going to employ from an angle of bank. Absolutely. Okay. We have a couple different bank angles that we'll use. The reasons we'll do that, uh, a shallower angle of bank will give us a bit more standoff for a target, mm. which is pretty important if you're out there messing with some AAA or something like right. that and you want a bit more standoff. And if it is AAA, are you going to use a certain weapon versus if it's troops in the open or if it's, I mean, how do you know what to use based on what's going on on the ground? It's really situation dependent, and maybe this is a good time to talk about some of the weapons on there. Sure. Myself, dealing with AAA, I found that a 105 air bursting munition is very effective against folks that are standing on a manned, non-moving AAA. Piece. Yeah, they yeah. don't really like that. Well, and just to, sorry to interrupt. So to your point earlier, you're not just hurling lead down there. These rounds are little explosives in their own right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, kind of maybe starting with the 30 millimeter, sure. you do have an HEI round. Um, High explosive incendiary. Exactly. Right. And then we have a TP round that sometimes, obviously we're going to use that in a Target training. practice. Mm -hmm. Target practice is just a solid chunk of metal that you're throwing out Still there. Still a lot of inertia. And it is, and it actually has a pretty good utility in combat when you're worried about collateral damage. Ah. So we'll sometimes mix in some TP with HEI, and then you can select what you're putting in the gun hmm. based on the mission set. So the 30 millimeter being a smaller munition is a low yield. That's really relatively. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Much smaller than the 105. <laughs> yeah. But it really helps in a troops in contact situation when okay. you're shooting in very close proximity. Kind of moving up the chain a little bit. The 40 millimeter, I know mm -hmm. there's some interest in that. That was a great weapon to use on the battle space. Again, it was like a sniper rifle in the sky, still low, low yield in comparison to a 105. On the 105 side, there's a couple different projectile bodies you can use. One of them is uh, that standard army casing that you referred to at the beginning with a couple different fuse combinations. Mm -hmm. You have one fuse, it's a uh, point detonating. So as soon as it hits something solid, it's going to go ahead and detonate and throw the frag around. You have a um, delay function, so you can get a little bit of penetration sure. out of that. So if there's some um, armor... Well, you're not going to no? do too well against armor, okay. but what it's really good is if you're shooting a building or something, uh, okay. you want to get through the roof, gotcha. have it detonate in a room and throw frag around the room. We do have one projectile. It's not really a different projectile case. It's a sleeve. It's a tungsten sleeve that they put on the front hmm. of the projectile. We would call it a hip, a hard and improved penetrator. You'll get pretty good penetration off of that, but still, you're not going to do anything against modern armor in okay. battle space. A recent development, I say recent, uh, would be probably in the last 15 years. There's a new 105 projectile. It's called a high frag. The older ones, the Army wasn't worried about uniform pieces of fragmentation. So when the round detonated, you would get little microscopic pieces of metal. Mm -hmm. And I've got a chunk of metal at home in my desk that's about 18 inches long. <laughs> so when you don't have that uniform frag, it makes it kind of difficult to weapon ear because sure. that giant piece is going to carry a lot of energy with it and go a long ways. Right. So what they did was they picked a metal that was a bit more brittle 
and then they have scored the inside of that projectile but they, before they put the explosive fill in there. And that imprints some metal memory. So when that round detonates, you get about 22,000 little pieces of uniform size frag. And then you marry that with an air bursting fuse. Mm -hmm. So when it comes out of the barrel, there's a little ampule that breaks, drops some electrolyte and a little Doppler radar starts pinging the ground. And when it gets to a certain height over the ground, that thing goes off and it is a crowd pleaser. Dang, I would think so. I, I, I need to someday get someone on the show who designs armament and weapons because they have to be sick individuals. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, if the business is killing, uh, you got to come up with some ways to do it. And yeah, there are similar proximity devices for bombs that mm -hmm. uh, I'm used to in my community. Speaking of bombs, if you're going to, in the future, employ a small diameter bomb, at that point, are you done with your orbit and you're going to maybe go out a few miles and turn around and come back and do like a lay down like a B-52, Mike? It really depends on the situation. It okay. may be good to use that in a suppression rule when you're on your way into the target area if there's some sort of threat. I don't want to get too much into the uh, employment tactics, sure. but you might check off a little bit of, say, a tank did roll in a, on the battle space. You mm -hmm. can go ahead and, and throw an SDB at it. Okay. And an AC-130 is not necessarily, uh, I'm guessing, going to be involved with, I don't know the exact nomenclature, but there's some sort of large parachute uh, drag bomb that can come out of a C-130. No. I think we just call it the MOAB, right? Yeah, so. the MOAB uh, doesn't really have a parachute except for an extraction. It's, right. it's free-falling at pretty high velocity, but that's typically employed from the MC-130. Okay. Yeah, because the inside of an AC-130 is full of these guns, and I'm guessing cases or some system, obviously, someone's thought of for controlling all your ammo and oh, absolutely. everything else you need. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're in the Whiskey and the J model that we have now, there's actually a couple pallet positions that are strapped into the floor, but there's a series of mission computers. Mm -hmm. There's chairs and monitors and hand controllers. There's no room in the wow. back for that. yeah. And this might be a dumb question, but you said a loadmaster earlier. I mean, if you guys are out there and you're really getting the job done, is there a concern about we need to move stuff around in the back of the airplane or is it all within limits? You're not going to move stuff, but that person is going to be responsible for getting that cargo door open if you had to get out and do an emergency egress okay. or the side doors or just help with the munitions loading. And it's great to have that extra person on there as an observer. Yeah. When you're in combat, the entire crew tends to be looking out the left side of the aircraft focused on what's happening mm. in that particular fight. So it's great to have an uncommitted set of eyes looking on the outside of the right. orbit for threats. And in fact, in Afghanistan, uh, some of my missions, uh, the loadmaster was the first person to see that threat coming up at the aircraft. Mm. And was there ever a need or a discussion about putting weapons on both sides? I mean, I guess it defeats the purpose if one side's pointing down and one side's pointing up, but... Yeah, no, it was always meant to have it on one side. Okay. Of the now, just again, from an aircraft point of view, is that a concern for the folks up front as far as balancing fuel? I mean, even just being in an orbit for a long time can wreak havoc on your inner ear. What's the actual practicality for the people on the airplane and the airplane itself? Yeah, the center of gravity um, concerns aren't that bad. It's, okay. it's managed pretty well, moving a little bit of fuel around and, and munitions. We can move stuff from the, the front to the back. In fact, that's something that the gunners would do. You really don't notice it when you're in okay. the left-hand orbit, although in the community, it's kind of a joke if you're a professional pilot and you're going from point A to point B and you're asked to enter holding, that gunship pilots can only do left-hand holding. Of course. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're in an orbit, the game is playing and nobody's worried about comfort or spilling a drink or anything else. You're, you're getting the job done. Absolutely. Yeah. Total focus. I know it's interesting that... There seems to be some uh, ongoing controversy. You know, they've talked about getting rid of the A-10, but the Air Force's commitment to close air support. The community that I flew in with the gunships, they are 100% dedicated to the folks on the ground. Yeah. And it's that proximity that we have. I talked about the habitual training relationship, but we have such an affinity for those folks and there's mm -hmm. a bond yeah. that uh, we are dedicated to close air support. Which is great because you're an Air Force asset and most of the people on the ground, I would argue, with the exception of a few PJs once in a while, are not Air Force. We're all joint. It's one team and the interesting yeah. piece about AFSOC is it's part of SOCOM. So even though we're Air Force assets, we're actually, we belong to SOCOM and most of the time we're employed by a Navy Admiral or an Army right. General that's yeah. controlling it. We certainly have that responsibility yeah. to those folks. Yeah, for sure. SOCOM Special Operations Command based in McDill. In McDill Air okay, Force Base Tampa, in Tampa, Florida. Correct. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, this is great. I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm looking at my list for the normal aircraft series. The AC-130 doesn't really fit it too well. But let's talk about performance. What 
would, and again, I know you don't want to talk about where you guys hang out, but what generally would be like a typical length of a mission? And some of these aircraft, especially the later models, can be refueled. But what was, you said you did a handful of combat missions. What was kind of typical for you? What's in your logbook? All the gunships starting with the H model on were aerial refueling okay. uh, capable. So, um, you know, just transiting the ocean. I flew a mission from uh, Hickam Air Force Base to Guam that was almost 18 hours. And, wow. Yeah, that's a, a bit of a pain. And we are unpressurized. So we did that at 10,000 feet, okay. which is a long way to go. Oof. But in combat, a lot of the missions, uh, some of them were shorter duration, five, six hours. But most of them, you would take off, you would transit 45 minutes or an hour to the target area, mm. spend four or five hours on station, push to a tanker, fill up, and then do another four or five hours before coming home. Most of the combat missions range from 10 to 12 hours. Wow. And some okay. of them went longer when the need arose. Mm -hmm. We did stay, I think my longest was 14.2. Uh, wow. Was the left seater kind of the aircraft commander? That's the person who's got the trigger, has the responsibility for the crew? Absolutely. Uh -huh. And and the thing about the gunship is it takes the entire crew sure. to employ. Of course. And that aircraft commander is, is, like I said before, leading an orchestra. And it's really about managing people and managing the mission. But at the end of the day, it's that aircraft commander, he or she has the ultimate responsibility because they hold the A code. So even though it's taken the entire group to put the weapons out, when you make the final decision, it rests on the aircraft commander's shoulder. I would think so. Usually in the military, you've got one person. Or the buck stops. Absolutely. Okay. Parachutes on the airplane, I almost hate to ask, but... Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'd ever get to use them. It might be a little difficult, but yeah, yeah we do have parachutes okay. and uh, an egress plan sure. if something were to happen. You're not wearing them, though? It depends. I think most of the variants now, they're, they still haven't adopted the seat parachute. But no, they were actually uh, just down at the bottom of the flight deck. You would grab one on your way to the back. Okay. Uh, so let's see speed. I mean, it's a C-130 effectively. So you guys are doing all your stuff that in a number, it probably begins with a two. Yeah. But in the H model, we pushed around at about 240 knots. Okay. Uh, so 300 miles an hour, sure. you know, roughly the J model that we have now is a, a lot more capable. It can go a lot higher and a lot faster. Okay. The engines on that thing are phenomenal. Is that also the beginning of the eight blade propellers or is that a uh, six bladed propeller? Six blade. There's a couple different variants. There's, I think they call it NP-1000 or something. There are a couple eight-bladed variants, but the standard J model has a six-bladed problem. Gotcha. Okay. Now, how about strengths and weaknesses? I mean, the strength, obviously, is that this thing is a, to borrow from the term from the B-17, I mean, it's a flying fortress. It's a lot of armament that's up there. Uh, and obviously, I would think it does that well. Let's just go to the weakness. Was there ever anything as you flew it that you thought, man, why doesn't someone just fix this? I think the biggest thing in it, it's not what they fix it. It's, I understood the context, but especially once Afghanistan kicked off, we were constantly incorporating new capabilities mm -hmm. before they were even fully tested at home. Okay. You know, the test community did their due diligence to make uh -huh. sure it wasn't unsafe. But uh, there were times when I flew with uh, land cables strapped with zip ties over top of the aircraft to get a different computer <laughs> display or different mm -hmm. video display up on the front. And I know that there's been a lot of work done by the command, by Air Force Special Operations Command, to deliver a, uh, a more mature product to the customer, that the ops customer that's out flying it. And what they've done is they've actually tried to break it into a couple different blocks, like the Viper when you flew it. Mm -hmm. So we have different blocks of the AC-130J that are being delivered with different capabilities. And when you do that, you go ahead and deliver, say, the Block 1015 up front, let it work through combat while we mature the Block 20 and then eventually the yeah. Block 30. Yeah. That's been the big thing. Yeah, and I think you could also make an argument for that is in a way a strength as well because it's adaptable. Absolutely. And so you've got people that are thinking about it, getting the funds they need to get whatever the best system, even if it has to be a little bit jury-rigged and uh, make you guys as effective as possible. All right, where has this thing seen action? I think it's been in just about every conflict in, in recorded history. <laughs> Pretty much. I think uh, when something happens, they ask, where are the carriers and where are the gunships? Yeah. Obviously, uh, Vietnam. Uh, I know they flew in uh, Grenada, Panama, uh, the Bosnia conflict, mm -hmm. Kosovo. They were in Desert Storm 1. They were in OIF, Afghanistan. And then a host of other uh, wow. hot spots that have flared up around the world, which is pretty impressive with a very small fleet. Because yeah. for a long time... The H model gunship side, we only had eight airplanes. Wow. And on the U model side, we only had 13. Now, after the first big push in OIF, they got funding to buy an additional four U models. So the fleet went out to 17 U models and eight H models. 
But as a capability, that's still a very small yeah. pool of assets to draw upon when you're trying to employ. You have to put airplanes in the depot. You still have to train. You have to test. Mm -hmm. It's very small numbers. Yeah. So are they all based in the uh, panhandle of Florida down there? They used to be all at Herbert Field in yeah. Florida, but now we've opened up a big base in New Mexico. That's where I was the vice commander. Yeah. And we have um, some gunships that are operating out west. And like any other squadron, presumably, you guys will grab a handful of airplanes and folks and deploy? Absolutely. Yeah. On a moment's notice. Um, that's kind of a basic tenet of SOCOM is being able to answer the nation's calls. Yeah. You can pick up and being air refueling capable. You know, just push to anywhere in the world you need to go. Yeah. Well, you've been to all these uh, different operations for the last, what, 40, 50 years. But, I mean, where would people know about the AC-130? Has it had its day in Hollywood or in the news? Yeah, I think there's a couple different Hollywood shows that have uh, picked up on the gunship. The <laughs> first right. being the, the movie The Green Beret, the old John Wayne classic. Oh, okay. If you've seen that, where he was uh, serving in Vietnam. I know of it. I honestly cannot remember. So. Oh, you got to watch it. Yeah. It, it's great because it's totally anathema to what I told you about. If a gunship was overhead a Hamlet, the Hamlet never fell. Right. Well, in the movie, the Hamlet falls and they call the gunship in to just clean house on all the, the <laughs> North Vietnamese and Viet Cong that uh -huh. take over and they just you know spray the thing down. The other uh, movie is obviously going to be the Transformers. Every airplane. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's in there. There's a, a term in there. You know, a lot of people say, make it rain. Yeah, let it rain, make it rain. And that term is just verboten in our community. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to make it rain. We pride ourselves on accuracy. Sure, We're not just going to roll in and spray an entire area. A Hollywood uh, catchphrase, our folks, our guys and girls really train to yeah. be as accurate as possible. And then I think the last one is uh, going to be the Call of Duty the uh, Xbox, PlayStation game series. Okay. The gunship has a couple different missions in there, and it's, it's highlighted. So All right. A lot of folks, even my son, are like, hey, Dad, look at this. It's cool. I'm a gunship pilot. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. I think it has a very, very brief cameo in uh, Lone Survivor when they're in the village towards the end. Of course, it's daylight, but, you know. Yeah, yeah there yeah, are yeah, missions. Yeah. I, yep. I actually did a daylight mission when a Talon II crashed. I stayed till way after uh, the sunrise. It's just a calculated risk when yeah. you're supporting those folks on the ground. Well, and speaking of that, didn't that happen in Desert Storm 1 back in 91? Was there a C1, AC-130 that stayed out a little too long? Yeah, there was, a, unfortunately, a AC-130H model from my squadron. It was well before my time. Did stay until after sunrise, and they were uh, taken down by a surface launched, mm. uh, shoulder launched surface air missile. Was that based on, if you're willing to say, I mean, they were reacting to someone who needed their help on the ground, or was it just lose SA of sunrise or what? I know I, they knew that the sun was up. They were just dedicated to the mission. Well, God bless them. I think I read that it took down 14 Absolutely, yeah, souls. Yeah. So we have a plaque of them in the squadron, those, those folks that dedicated their lives. Yeah. And um, again, it just speaks to that commitment we have to, yeah. to getting the mission done yeah. to the customer. No doubt about it. All right. How about a good story? Um, you've flown this thing quite a bit. Any particular missions stand out in your mind as you look back at your career in the AC-130? Yeah, maybe a, a funny one and just a, a combat one. Okay. The, the funny one was uh, after the first big push in Afghanistan, we had a whole bunch of senior officers, uh, senior general officers come down to Hurlburt. They wanted to learn more about special ops. So okay. we put on this big giant dog and pony show. <laughs> and I had a couple general officers with me and I was out flying I was briefly talked to you about how the, the system works, feeding all the information into the computer so that when you employ, uh, you're getting a very accurate solution. But the airplane has a couple different modes of employing. That first mode, probably the most accurate or what they would say would be the auto trainable. So the sensor is feeding the mission computer, the guns are on hydraulic mounts, and they would steer to point the gun to compensate for the lead and lag angles. Mm -hmm. Say something happens to the hydraulics or the mission computer, you may have to drop down a step to where now the gun isn't moving around and it's just locked into what I would call a null position. So okay. then it's the pilot compensating up front. And then you may lose the mission computer altogether. And, and in the HUD, there's actually a position you can select called the standby reticle. Whenever I was doing a tweak, I would always pull up that standby reticle and adjust or put in the compensation we talked about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, this one general was asking, how does it work in the degraded modes? I'm like, here, well, let me show you. So I set it up to, to shoot it in what a lot of the crew members would say would be the least accurate mode in the manual mode. There are no mission computer inputs. There's no symbology. It is just the standby reticle. Uh -huh. And as luck would have it, we were shooting an older round we don't have anymore. It was a 105 Willie Pete round. Okay. So it's filled with white phosphorus. Yeah. So I tune the system up, I push out one round at a tank, and a blind squirrel found a nut, and it went right through the entrance of the turret. 
And when it did, it detonated and a basically a smoke circle popped up out of that and came all the way up slowly through our altitude. Wow. And I was like, safe the gun, I'm good. That's and he's right. like, that's amazing. You guys must do that every day. I'm like, yes, that's yes, right. we do. As far as you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, maybe a combat story would be, uh, that just speaks to the, again, to the dedication, mm-hmm. was the seriousness with which we employed and how close we would employ Gunships, I think it's known the battles in Fallujah and Iraq, and there yeah. a lot of tough fights in Afghanistan as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, my personal record was shooting 27 meters away from the friendlies. Wow. So think about a fight where they're fighting across a street in two different buildings, and you're putting rounds into the house across the street. Mm-hmm. I will never forget putting my finger on that button and just one last safety check before I push the button to give consent to fire the weapon because I was very concerned. Fratricide is something I never want to live with. Of course. With. Time stood still for me. Yeah. And we pushed the button and we got the results we wanted. That's amazing. Did you ever end up meeting any of those guys later? Uh, oh, yeah. I've yeah. met uh, a couple of guys that I worked for. One particular team, I'll try to maybe dumb down the story a little okay. bit, but uh, saved a, a soft team and then on my way out of country happened to run into the that same soft team the one individual that was calling in the fires that night, just through a quick chat, we put it all together. He was like six foot six special operator. And he gave me the biggest bear hug that was like a <laughs> chiropractor, you know, working on my back. But it was genuine affection. Uh, and I will carry that with me for the rest of my life. Jokes aside, this is a special business. There's an element of that that's absolutely okay and expected. And so I don't know if you're willing to answer this. If you guys are no kidding in a situation like where you're just unleashing everything, helping folks out, how much are you carrying? Are you going to be up there for a while or are you going to run out fairly quickly? Like in an F-18, if I hold on the trigger, which I've never done, but if I did, I have five and a half seconds of bullets. That's it. Oh, no. We have pretty deep magazines, and that's one of the strengths. We talked about the weaknesses, Mm -hmm. but the strength of the gunship is the ability to loiter for a long time over the target area and uh, several thousand rounds of 30 millimeter. In fact, we can floor load extra boxes of 30 that they can reload in flight, (laughs) and they carry a lot of 105. There's a lot of smackdown on the airplane, and if you regulate the amount you're putting out, you can stay on station and, and really protect those folks for a long time. Well, you can almost understand the make it rain because if you guys can really do that that long, I mean, it's, yeah, it's Hollywood, but all right, that sounds pretty cool. All right, hey, Buck, if you're willing, I told our Patreon supporters, that's the folks who help us out financially and they get exclusive perks, that I was coming to meet you today. And so they have some questions. Absolutely. So how about a lightning round? All right, we'll call let's go. It, all right, so it doesn't mean one word answers, but let's call this because I have quite a few and uh, we'll go through them as quickly as we can. So, all right, uh, let's see, Newman asks... Is the cabin pressurized? You said it was not. Correct. Okay. So then he wants to know, or she, I'm not sure who Newman is, um, are there environmental controls or is it like the World War II bombers where the crew need specially heated jackets? The folks in the back, now I'm going to speak to a couple different variants again. The AC-130H was not pressurized. Okay. There were so many holes cut in the airplane for the munitions you couldn't right. uh, pressurize. The U model did have the ability to pressurize, but when they would go to employ, they would depressurize and go ahead hmm. and shoot. Same thing with the Whiskey and, and the J model. So the folks flying in the back would actually wear what they called Mustang suits that are gunners. And that was the suit that was developed to support the uh, B-17 guys. I don't (laughs) believe they were electrically heated, but they're just really insulated. We did have some environmental controls up front. But the bigger concern was that you're on oxygen. You're wearing a mask like that. You flew uh, F-18s for a long time. But if you wear it day in and day out, we would get this little notch in our nose. And my Mm -hmm. personal record was I flew 80 combat hours in eight days. And the biggest thing that bothered me was being on oxygen that long. It just dries you out. You're pumping as much water as you can. And that mask pushing on your face, your nose was sore for a couple of weeks after. Yeah. And then it was at 100% oxygen? Um, No, it's actually regulated. Yeah, You would go 100% at a certain point. Right. If you uh, need to. Depending on the altitude. Because for me also, when I would fly a lot, my inner ear, I guess it retains some of that oxygen. And so you'd always have trouble on the ground. That was a constant for us because you'd fly this long mission. Then you'd Mm -hmm. get back to base, do the debrief. And then you want to get a little bit of chow and grab some sleep. And you'd be waking up in the middle of the night having to clear your ears yeah. because, of, like you mentioned, the saturation. Yep. All right. Uh, Paolo asks, any differences in providing fire support in daylight versus nighttime? Uh, employment is the same. The biggest concern is going to be the threats in daylight because right. at night we can hide from a lot of the folks that might be able to see us uh, in the day. It's a little bit harder to do. So we'll probably push up an altitude a bit. Okay. 
but for the weapons, it's the same. Okay. If you do that, I guess it affects your accuracy a little bit, but also do you end up in a steeper angle of bank or? No, the bank angle is uh, all relative to your slant range from the target. Okay. So we'll pick a couple different variations. If we wanted to stand off just a little bit, right. we might have a shallower bank okay. angle. A steeper bank angle is obviously going to tighten up that turn circle. All right. So to your point earlier, there's a lot of trigonometry. So people who like triangles, you guys are firing down the hypotenuse, although it's not a straight line because it's not a laser, right? So we are constantly trying to fly on the tangent of the circle. And if you think about it, uh, the way I like to describe to people, if you take an orange traffic cone, and I'm sorry it's the lightning round, but maybe this That's will right. put it into perspective. If you take an orange traffic cone that people are used to seeing and flip it upside down, so where the small piece is touching the ground, that's what our orbit looks like, that big piece at the right. top. However, when there's winds, it's no longer a perfect circle. And I've flown in 60, 70 knot winds up at altitude. When you're flying into the wind, yeah, that's great. It slows things down. You really got to shallow your bank angle. Mm. But when you get on the other side of the orbit and the wind is pushing you, now you're fighting. You're flying a very steep bank angle, trying to stay in position to employ against that target that's on the ground and you end up with a bit of an ellipse rather yeah. than a circle. When I used to do close air support in the F-18, sometimes we'd have run-in restrictions based on various things going on on the ground. Was that a factor for you guys at all? No. And that's another big difference in most cases, unless we were shooting very, very close to families, mm -hmm. we might try to do that. You know, pointy nose employment, they typically don't want to run in that's going to come directly over the friendlies because they're worried about a, a short bomb. Right. That's actually the safest place for a gunship to hmm. employ because you can't fire it straight down. So uh, we would typically be able to employ all the way around the orbit. And then if we had some of our pointy nose friends, we did a lot of joint missions with the A-10s. I've actually worked with F-18s and F-14s. And we would put them on different sides of the orbit and have them do run-ins while we were shooting. Wow. A lot of smackdown. Um, sad I never had a chance to do that. Okay. Paolo has another question. Let's see. Uh, how do pilots need to fly the airplane as guns are firing? I mean, is there anything different you're doing when the actual guns are firing? Not when they're firing. The biggest thing we do up front is... The pilot, it's a lot of stick and rudder skills, but you'll typically turn the autopilot on just for the elevator, just for altitude hold. Because as you're solving that trigonomic equation, altitude a difference of 10 or 20 feet can actually make a big difference on mm -hmm. the ground. Airspeed has an even bigger component. So the co-pilot is typically managing the throttles and the pilot is managing the aileron and the rudders because the pilot is sitting there looking through the heads up display, making very fine muscle memory changes to try and superimpose and keep that aim point on the target. Okay. So the co-pilot, as he's managing the airspeed, will sometimes, if he, find, he or she finds that they're a little bit low, they'll just push up the two inboard engines to put a little more airflow over the wing, and they'll just push the airplane up 10 or 20 feet. So it's very detailed yeah. uh, flying. It takes a lot of focus to do yeah. it. But when you shoot the guns, it's the same. There's a couple small changes that happen if you're trying to superimpose. Mm -hmm. So I may superimpose, shoot, and then I may come off while they're reloading the 105 just to give me a little bit of time to correct for the winds. And then I'll roll right back in as soon as they call gun ready. All right. Stefan asked, do the cannons, especially the 105, have any traverse adjustment? So we talked about that already. Absolutely. The yeah. guns on the modern gunship are steerable. Okay. And then he also asks, uh, what kind of communication goes on between the flight deck and the weapons officers in the back during the weapon employment itself? Huge communication. Yeah. In the H model gunship, you could listen to up to eight different radios and four different comm nets all at the same time. As you started to degrade down to brainstem power, you would start shedding radios and comm <laughs> yeah. nets. Typically, um, you would pass some of those duties off to the co-pilot or other crew members. You would stay on the TAC net and then just talking to the sensor operators, mm -hmm. the fire control officer, the navigator, and then obviously the folks on the ground. Who would be the person in the airplane talking to the person on the ground? On the H model gunships, that was the navigator. Okay. Cool. All right. John Clark asks, how much weight does the full complement of weapons, ammunition, targeting systems, and crew add to the C-130? So is the AC-130 quite a bit heavier than the AC it, uh, C-130? It really is. Um, almost every mission on a typical C-130 before the J came along, the max peacetime weight was 155,000 pounds. And almost every training mission I took off was at 155,000 pounds. So that's a, quite a bit more. John goes on to ask, why has the AC-130 had so many iterations of weapons over its life? And I think we've talked about that. Weapons have improved. Weapons have improved. The threat has changed and drove, driven us up to higher altitudes. Grant asks, can you trace the development? And I think we did this from the C-47 to the current C-130. All right. Let me put a plug in there. There's yeah. a gentleman in the headquarters 
who's about to release. He's been working on a book for a couple of years, A Complete History of a Gunship, and the viewers may want to keep an eye out for that. Cool. All right. We don't know a title of it yet or anything? I don't know the title yet. How about uh, this question from Kenneth Dahl? How would a Ford Air Controller, and you said there are facts actually on the airplane itself, right? Well, the airplane can act as a fact oh, okay. uh, if we right. had to. But suppose you had a JTAC on the ground. Mm-hmm. How would that person uh, call in the strike? Is it different from, let's say, an F-16 or a strike aircraft of some sort? It's similar. We're going to use the nine line just like everybody else in the battle okay. space. But a lot of times once we're overhead, then they're going to abbreviate the nine line down to just a couple items. Because right. they're going to say, hey, you know where I'm at. You see my strobe. <laughs> yeah. And he'll throw a laser out there at the target. Questions? Let's get it. Yeah, there you go. Joseph Grisella says, is the U.S. Air Force looking to replace or update the AC-130 in the near future? If so, what is potentially going to be changed? So the big change that has happened is the legacy gunships that I talked about, the H model, the U model, and the Whiskey are all being replaced by the AC-130J. They're pushing along with that. I don't know how many tail numbers they have right now, but they're going to have um, 37 gunships here in the next couple of years, and they will all be AC-130Js, which is great not to have a mixed fleet anymore because now you can move people back and forth between the squadrons, and it makes it easier to do upgrades. Now, you've already touched on this, but Jacob Meltzler asks, is Call of Duty Modern Warfare the equivalent of Top Gun for the AC-130 community? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even familiar with what that is. Is that it's a video game, right? There's a, a video game and there's a particular mission where you're a gunship on station okay. chasing some bad guys. Well, as I've said on this show multiple times, if the video games were like real world, it'd probably be insanely boring. It would be. <laughs> it really, it'd be way easier if yeah. it was that easy as it is in the, yeah. in the game. And speaking of boring, so in my community, briefs and debriefs, although vital, are, I think, somewhat boring to the person who wants to know about this world. What is it like for you guys? Is there, obviously, you're going to talk about the threats and all that, but are you, are people changing roles or does one person on a crew have the same role every time? What are you guys briefing and debriefing? I guess Yeah, everybody asking. has the same role and the aircraft commander is going to lead that pre-brief. Uh, different folks that have different segments of the mission will get up, like the navigator may get up and say, hey, we're going to do our air refueling at this particular time any specific targets of interest, the crew will will go through that. The real bread and butter, and as you know from Top Gun, is the debrief. And we spend a lot of time, especially since we've now professionalized to have the weapons school, Mm -hmm. uh, we have really professionalized our debriefs to capture those lessons learned so we can increase that learning curve and make ourselves more capable on the battlefield. Yeah. Well, and I didn't, address it when you said earlier, but uh, we do need to get an episode on the show about the weapons school because I would agree that it's somewhat like Top Gun, but I would disagree in so much as the Air Force Weapons School is really more of a holistic Air Force force. 100% agree. Yeah. The folks that, that graduate sometimes, uh, well, you're supposed to be humble, credible, and approachable is the mantra of the right. weapons school, but you kind of come out as a Jedi Knight, and I don't mean that as your supernatural capable, but you have an understanding of the entire tool set that the Mm -hmm. Air Force has. A gunship weapons officer may not be an expert at F-22 employment, but he or she will know who to talk to or where to go to get those details. Right. The credibility that that patch brings is just the ability to go out and find the key information so that we can employ as a total force. So we still spend a lot of time on being able to employ the airplane to the max extent possible. It's a six-month program. Um, but we do spend a pretty big block of that time learning about the other capabilities yeah. that the, the Air Force has. And that's part of the education of a patch wearer is to understand all those other parts of the puzzle. Absolutely. Cool. Well, Buck, we've talked about the future of the AC-130. What's the future hold for you? Well, now I'm working for a major defense contractor. I'm going to do this for a little bit longer and then uh, just hang up the spurs and have a little bit of fun. <laughs> I, I recently bought an airplane, so I've been enjoying that. And uh, just as much family time as I can possibly enjoy. Absolutely. Well, that's leading a good life, I would say, right there. All right. And you've listened to the show. You know the drill. Our final question, as always, is how did someone come up with a call sign Buck for Craig Walker? Well, I I wish it was uh, some great story. But uh, unfortunately, when you hit a deer with an airplane, (laughs) <laughs> specifically an eight-point buck. Oh, wow. Uh, that tends to stick with you. I'm actually shocked that my call sign didn't morph over the years to Dr. Doolittle because I know a lot of pilots have hit a lot of different uh, animals, specifically birds, but I have the distinction of hitting a deer, a lot of birds, a fox, and an alligator. <laughs> Well, be glad that it was, in fact, a buck and not a doe. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want that one. When I was in uh, flight school in T2s in Meridian, Mississippi, for whatever reason, there was this fox crossing the the uh, runway and we had paddles out on station, you know, the landing signal guys just watching for people's gear to be down. I had mentioned that there was this animal on the runway and they said, is it still there? And I said, no, it skedaddled. 
And I don't know why I use that. And he goes, Roger skedaddled. <laughs> Thankfully, that didn't turn into a call sign, but yeah, you just never know. So, okay, so you've got quite a few silhouettes uh, painted on the side of your... Yeah, the Fox was a really funny one. He, The uh, infrared operator, sensor operator, it's on the front of the nose. So as we're coming into land, he called out and said, hey, pilot, there's a Fox on the runway just as I was touching down. And uh, he said, he's coming from left to right. So I'm looking out there and finally I see him and he is indeed going from left to right. So I aim to where he was. Right. And wouldn't you know it, he stops, turns around and runs right back in front of me and I nailed him. <laughs> All right. Well, did the buck, which was the biggest, uh, cause any damage? Yeah, a little bit of damage. Yeah. Uh, I had some of the uh, antlers embedded in the wing, but uh, oh well. <laughs> did you keep those? I didn't keep the, the <laughs> antlers. I kept part of the wing. <laughs> Part of the wing. Part of the wing. I had a little piece of sheet metal there. Oh, so. okay. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have to replace the whole no, thing. No, just, okay. no. <laughs> oh, boy. The stories are the best part of this show, I swear. <laughs> Buck, you know, every episode, I think to myself, okay, there's so much we could go on and on. And I've taken lately to simply asking, what have I not asked you that the listener needs to know about the AC-130? I think the biggest thing about the gunship is, I touched on it, the dedication to the ground user, yeah. but that we're not a platform that's just going to roll in and spray everything they see. We are truly dedicated to accuracy. Mm -hmm. That's just embedded in the DNA of every person that walks in the door to start their gunship training is the dedication to the ground user and let's be as accurate as possible yeah. on the battlefield. Will that person, by the way, who walks in the door be a brand new second lieutenant coming out of flight school? They are now. Um, okay. I think we started that maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but it used to be you had to have a tour in Slick C-130s or some other platform. You had mm -hmm. to have so many hours, but we're taking pilots right out of pilot training and they're doing just fine. Awesome. Well, Buck, I know I've learned a lot. I hope the listener has as well. This has been a lot of fun. I want to thank you for your time and your 26 years of service and everything else you're doing. And uh, it's been great. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Jello. Really enjoyed it. All right. All right. Thanks again, Buck. Well, man, what a great dude. Really loved that interview. I learned a lot as I always do. Now, as I mentioned before the interview began, that was recorded back in January before the pandemic. So I checked in with Buck the other day before recording this portion of the show. And he says he and his family are doing just fine. Thank you. Surviving down there in the Florida panhandle. Now, Buck is active on our various fighter pilot podcast, Facebook groups. So if you are also on there, be sure to look for Craig Walker and maybe you can interact with him a little bit. Also, the book he mentioned evidently won't be out until 2021 at the earliest, so we'll all have to just cool our jets for that. No pun intended. And yes, I know it's awful that I can't remember whether I've seen John Wayne's Green Beret movie or not. Evidently, I need to cue it up again. And it's also true, please be gentle, I do not play Call of Duty or most other video games. I just don't have the time, frankly. Now, I was surprised by the amount of pilot input Buck described was required when prosecuting attacks. I guess I just figured that an AC-130 was a lot like ground-based artillery, but air-based. I don't know. I didn't think there was a whole lot the pilots would need to do other than get to the general piece of sky and let the guns rain it down, even though we learned that's not what they do. But apparently that is not the case, and I probably should have known. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But honestly, the biggest takeaway from the whole interview, to me anyway, had nothing to do with AC-130s, but was something Buck said when describing weapons school graduates. Humble, credible, approachable. Now, you young people out there hoping to make it in this business someday, or really anyone hoping to make it in any industry, I can't think of three better attributes to internalize if you want to succeed. Humble, credible, approachable. And I'm going to have to write that out and put it on my mirror or someplace where I'll see it. That's good stuff. All right. Well, hey, we've reached the part in the show where we want to acknowledge our new Patreon strike leads, David Graham, Lewis Bell, and Junish Schilt. As a reminder, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So that will do it for this week. But before you go, there is one more thing that came up in the interview that I did not mention, and I want to close with it. As we wrap up, I want to dedicate this episode, episode 80 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, to the memory of Spirit 03, the AC-130 hotel lost during the Battle of Kafji on the morning of January 31st, 1991. On board Spirit 03 were Major Paul Weaver, Captains Thomas Bland, Arthur Galvin, William Grimm, and Dixon Walters, Senior Master Sergeants Paul Buegi and Jim May, Technical Sergeants Robert Hodges and John Olschlager, Staff Sergeants John Blessinger, Tim Harrison, Damon Kanua, and Mark Schmoss, 
And finally, Sergeant Barry Clark. Rest in peace, gentlemen. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show, and don't forget to share us with your network. Thanks for listening.